everyone, and welcome once again to Drunk Shakespeare. Tonight's play is Macbeth, and we have several very talented performers with us this evening, many for the first time, and we are just so happy to have everyone. So without further ado, we are going to go ahead and kick it off and begin Macbeth. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That will be ere the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Malkin. Paddock calls. Anon. There, there is foul. Is foul. And foul is fair. Hover through, through the fog, the fog and filthy, and filthy, and filthy air. air. What bloody man is that? He can report as seemeth by his plight of the revolt, the newest state. Malcolm, oh Malcolm, where art thou? Drink. Ah, I come. And this is the sergeant, and seemeth by his plight, uh, who like a good and hearty soldier fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend. Say to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou didst leave me. Doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonald, Worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him from the western isles of kerns and gallow glasses is supplied. And fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion, carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops <laughs> and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. As whence the sun gin his reflection, shipwrecking storms and direful thunders break, so from that spring, where comfort seemed to come, discomfort swells. Mark, King of Scotland, mark. No sooner justice had, with valor armed, compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord, surveying vantage, with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Dismayed not to saw Captain Macbeth and Banquo. Yes. <laughs> and sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. <laughs> if I say sooth, I must report they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks. So they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe, except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or, or memorize another Golgotha, I cannot tell. But I'm faint. My gashes cry for help. <laughs> so well thy words become thee as thy wounds. They smack of honor both. Go, get him surgeons. Uh, who comes here? Oh, the worthy Thane of Ross. What a haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the queen. Whence camest thou, worthy Thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cardor, began a dismal conflict, so that Belladonna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with 
self comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit. It to conclude the victory fell on us. Ah, great happiness! <laughs> that now swayed him. The Norway's king craves composition. Nor would we deign him burial of his men till he dispersed at St. Combs Inch $10,000 to our general use. No more that thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go, pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. <laughs> what he hath lost, noble Macbeth has won. Hmm. She she here? Nicole? Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I, a roint the witch, the rump fed runyon cries. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger. But in a sieve, I'll thither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. <laughs> I'll give thee wind. Thou art kind. And I another. I myself have all the other, and the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know in the shipman's card. I'll drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid. Where weary seven nights, nine times nine, shall he dwindle, peak and pine. Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest tossed. Look what I have. Show me, show me. Here, I have a pilot's thumb, oh. racked as Lord as he did come. A <laughs> drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. The weird, weird sisters, sisters, hand in hand, hand quarters hand, of the sea and land, and dust to go around, go back. Thrice, thrice to thine, thrice, 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 how far does it call the forest? What are these? So withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet aren't. Live you, or are you aught that man may question? You seem to understand me. By each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women, and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak if you can. What are you? All hail Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glamis. All hail Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Ken Cowdor. All hail Macbeth. That shall be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear? Things that do sound so fair in the name of truth, are, are you fantastical or that indeed which outwardly you show? My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me, you speak not. And if you can look into the seeds of time and see which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. Hail. 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 Lesser than Macbeth and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. Hey, you imperfect speakers, tell me more. By Sinnel's death I know I am fame of Gloms, but how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives! A prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cawdor. 
Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, or why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting? Speak, I charge you! The earth has bubbles as water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air, and what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind. Would they had stayed. Were such things here as we do speak about, or have we eaten the insane root that takes reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings? And you shall be kings. <laughs> and say no cord or two. <laughs> Why not so? <laughs> the self same words, tune and words. Who's here? The king hath happily received Macbeth the news of thy success, and when he reads thy personal venture and the rebels fight, his wonders and his praises do contend which should be thine or his. Silence with that, in viewing o'er oh, the rest of the self-same day, he finds thee in the stout Norwayan ranks. Nothing afeard of what thyself didst make, strange images of death. As thick as tail came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defense, and poured them down before him. We are sent to give thee from royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. And for an earnest of greater honor, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cawdor, in which addition hail most worthy Thane, for it is thine. Uh, what can the devil speak true? Uh, the, the Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both, he labored in his country's rack, I know not. But treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Moms and Thane of Cawdor, the greatest is behind. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope that your children shall be kings, when those that gave the Thane of Cawdor to me promised no less to them? That trusted home might ye and kindle you under the crown. Besides, the Thane of Cawdor, but strange, and you know, oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to be traced in deepest consequence. Cousins, a word, I pray you. Two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen! This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man. The function is smothered in surmise and nothing is but what is not. Look how our partner's wrapped. If chance will have me king, why, <laughs> chance may crown me without my stir. New honors come upon him like our strange garments, cleave not to their mold, but with the aid of use. Come what may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Oh, give me your favor! <laughs> My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. Think upon what hath chanced, and more time, the interim having waited. Let us speak our free hearts, each to other. Very gladly. Till then enough. Come, friends.
Is the execution done on Cawdor? Uh, are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back, but I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that, very frankly, he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as to a careless trifle. There's no art to find the man's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Oh, worthiest cousin. The sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. Thou art so far before the softest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Wouldst thou hadst less deserved that the proportions both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. Service and the loyalty I owe in doing, it pays itself. Your highness part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do but what they should by everything safe toward your love and honor. <laughs> Welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee, and will labor to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo, thou hast no less deserved, nor must be known no less to have done so, let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. There, if I grow, the harvest is your own. <laughs> my plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Uh, sons, kinsmen, thanes, and you whose places are the nearest, know we will establish our estate upon our eldest Malcolm, whom we will name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which Honor must, yet unaccompanied, invest in him only. But signs of nobleness, like stars, shall, si shall shine on all deservers, from hence to Inverness, and bind us further to you. The rest is labor which is not used for you. I'll be the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So humbly take my leave. My worthy Cawdor. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap, for in my way it lies. Stars hide your fires. Let not light see my dark and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. True worthy Banquo. He is full so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let's after him, whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is peerless kinsman. met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the prophetic report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves heir, into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it came missives from the king who all hailed me, Thane of Cordor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hail, king that shall be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the Jews of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart, and farewell. Glams thou art, and Cordor and shall be what thou art promised. Yet though I do, I do fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. 
thou wouldst be great. Art not without ambition, but without the illness should attack it. What thou wouldst hide, thou wouldst thou holily. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou didst have a great glance, that which cries, Thus thou must do, if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishes to be undone. I thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned with all. What is your tidings? Messenger, what is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. That mad to say it. Is not thy master with him, who would so would have informed for preparation? So please your grace, my thane is coming. He brings great news. The raven himself is hoarse, that crooks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlement. Come, you spirits, that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose. Nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gore, you murdering ministers, wherever in your slightest substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pour thee in the dunner smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. Great glance, worthy cordial. Oh. Oh. Greater than both, are they all hail their heart. My letters have transported me beyond ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dear love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall some that tomorrow see. Your face, my thing, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, Look like the time. Their welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for. And you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come did solely sovereign sway and master up. We will speak further. Only look up clear. To alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. This guest of summer, uh, the temple haunting Martlet, does approve by his loved masonry that heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No duty frees, buttress, or coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle. Where they most breed and haunt, I have observed, the air is delicate. Ah, see, see our honored hostess, the love that follows us sometime in our trouble, which still we think as love. 
Herein I teach you how you shall bid God build us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. For our service. In every point twice done, a man done double. What poor and single business to contend against those honors deep and broad, broad, herewith your majesty loads our hands. For those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your homage. Where's the Thane of Cawdor? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, but he rides well, and his great love, sharp as his spur, hath helped him. <laughs> uh, fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. Your servants ever have theirs, themselves, and what is theirs in come to make their audit at your highness pleasure, still to return your own. Give me your hand. <laughs> Conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. <laughs> if it were done, when it is done, then for well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here. We that but teach bloody instructions, which being taught return to plague the inventor, this even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his, sin, his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then, as his host, who should against the murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculty, so meek hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off, and pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sight of my intent but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. How now? What news? He has almost sunk. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? No, you not he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought Golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk, wherein you dressed yourself? Have it slept since? And wakes it now, to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Art thou a fear to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage? Privy peace! I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more than man. Your time, your place did then adhere. And yet you have made both. They have made themselves. And that their fitness now does and make you. I have given suck. And I know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, whilst it was smiling in my face, I plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail! We fail! But screw your courage to the sticking place, and we'll not fail. When Duncan is asleep, 
whether the Raga on his day's hard journey found me invited. His two chamberlains were I with wine and were so, so convinced that memory, the warder of the brain shall be a few, and the receipt of reason a limbic oath. When in swinish sleep their drenched natures lie as in a death, what can not you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quarrel? Bring forth men children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received? When we have marked with blood these sleepy two of our of his own chamber and used their very daggers that they have done it. Who dares receive it other? As we shall make our griefs and clamor roar upon his death. I am settled and bend up every corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what false heart doth know. How goes the night, boy? Noon is down. I have not heard the clock. And she goes down at twelve? I take this later, sir. Uh, hold. Take my sword. Ugh, the husbandry in heaven and their candles are all out. Take that too. A heavy summons lies like lead upon me. And yet I would not sleep. Merciful powers restrain me in the cursed thoughts that nurture gives way into repose. Give me my sword. Who's there? A friend. What, sir? Not yet at rest? The king's abed. He hath been in unusual pleasure and sent forth great largesse to your offices. This diamond he greets your wife withal. By the name of most kind hostess, and shut up in measureless content. Oh, being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect, and which else would free have wrought? All's well. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. I think not of them. Yet, when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business, if you would grant the time. At your kindest leisure. If you shall cleave to my consent, when tis, I shall make honor for you. So I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear. I shall be counseled. Good repose the while. Thanks, sir. The like be to you. Go. Bid thy mistress when my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell. Get thee to bed. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand. Come, let me cut thee. I have thee not yet, I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? Huh. I see thee yet in form as palpable as that which now I draw. Thou marshalest me the way I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still! And on thy dudgeon and blade, gouts of blood, which was not so before. There's no such thing! It is the bloody business which informs us to mine eyes. 
Now or the one half world of nature seems dead and wicked dreams abuse the curtain's sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch thus with his stealthy pace with Tarkin's ravishing strides towards his design moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabouts and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. Well, as I threat, he lives. Words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. That which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. Quench them have given me fire. Hark! It was the owl that shrieked, the fatal bellman, which gives the sternest good night. It is about it. The doors are open, and the perverted grooms do mock their charge with snores. I have dropped their possets. The death and nature do contend about them. Whether they live or die. Is there? What ho? Alack. They have awaked and is not done. The attempt and not the deed confounds us. Hark. I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. My husband? I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owl scream and the cricket's cry. Did not you speak? When? Now. As I descended? I. Hark! Who lies in the second chamber? Don Albe. This is a sorry sight. A foolish thought to say a sorry sight. There's one did did laugh in his sleep and, and one cried murder that that they did wake each other. I, I stood and heard them, but uh, they did say their prayers and and address them again to sleep. There are two lodged together. One cried, God bless us and amen the other, as they had seen me with these hangmen's hands. Listening to their fear, I, I could not say amen when they did say, God bless us. Consider it not so deeply. But wherefore can I not pronounce amen? Oh, I had most need of, of blessing and, and amen, amen stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be fought after these ways, so it would make us mad. He thought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. <laughs> Macbeth does murder sleep, <laughs> the innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds, chief nourisher in life's feasts. <laughs> what do you mean? Still it cried, sleep no more, to all the house. Gloms hath murdered sleep and... <laughs> Macbeth shall sleep no more. Who was it that thus cried? No more. My worthy fame, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brave and sickly of things. Go! Get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring these daggers from the place? <laughs> they must lie there. Go, or carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I, I'll go no more. I am afraid to think on what I have done. Look on it again, I dare not. Confirm a purpose. Give me the daggers. <laughs> I'm the dead, a butter's pictures. To the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll go the faces of the grooms with all. For it must seem their guilt. Whence is that knocking? Oh, how is it with me when every noise appalls me? <laughs> oh, 
what hands are here? <laughs> they pluck out mine eyes. <laughs> Will all great nature's ocean wash this blood clean from my hands? No, this rather my hand Will the multitudinous seas incarnadine, making the green one red? Miserable O'Connor, but I shame to wear a heart so white. I hear a knocking at the south entrance. Retire we to our chamber. A little water cleanses up the steed. How easy is it then? Constancy have left you unattended. Hark! More knocking. Get on your nightgown, lest occasion call us and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. To know my deed, to our best not know myself. Wake Duncan with thy knocking! I would thou couldst! Here's a knocking, indeed. Yeah, if a man were porter of hell gate, he, he should have old turning the key. Knock, knock. Who's there in the name of the Elzebub? Oh. Here's a farmer that hanged himself on the expectation of plenty. Come in time, have napkins enough about you. <laughs> Here you'll sweat for it. Oh, knock, 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 knock. Who's there in the other devil's name? Hey, here's an equivocator that could swear in both scales against either scale. Who committed treason enough for God's sake, yet could not equivocate to heaven. Oh, come in, equivocator. <laughs> Knock, knock, knock. Who's there? Oh, fame. Here's an English tailor come hither for stealing out of a French hose. <laughs> come in, tailor. Here may you roast your goose. Knock. Knock! <laughs> Never a, a quiet. What are you? But this place is, is too cold for hell. <laughs> Y'all devil porter it no further. I had thought to let in some of all the professions that go the primrose way to the everlasting bonfire. A nun! A nun! <laughs> Remember the porter. Was it so late, friend, ere you went to bed, that you do lie so late? Sir, we were carousing till the second cock, and Drink, sir, <laughs> is a great provoker of three, three things. <sighs> what three things does drink especially provoke? Marry, sir, nose painting, <clears throat> sleep, and urine. Now, ah, uh, lettering, sir, it provokes. And it unprovokes, it provokes the desire, but takes away the performance. Therefore, much drink, 
Mary said to be an equivocator with lechery. It makes him and it mars him. It sets him on and it takes him off. It persuades him and disheartens him, makes him stand to and not stand to. In conclusion, equivocates him in his sleep and giving him the lie leaves him. I believe drink gave you the lie last night. That it did, sir, in the very throat of me. <laughs> but I, requi I requited him for his lie. And I think being too strong for him, though he uh, took my legs at some time, yet I made shift to cast him. Is thy master stirring? Our knocking has awakened him. Here he comes. Good morrow, noble sir. <sighs> oh, good morrow, both. Is the king stirring, worthy thane? Not yet. He did command me to call timely on him. I have almost hit the hour. I'll bring you to him. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet is one. Uh, the labor we delight in physics pain. This is the door. I'll make so bold to call, for tis my limited service. Goes the king hence today? Uh, he did, he did a point so. The night has been unruly. Where we lay, our chimneys were blown down, and as they say, lamentings heard of the air, strange screams of death, and prophesying with accents terrible, of dire combustion and confused events, new hatched, the woeful time. The obscure bird clamored the lifelong night. Some say the earth was feverous and did shake. Twas a rough night. My young remembrance cannot parallel a fellow to it. <laughs> horror! Horror! Tongue no heart cannot conceive nor name thee. What's the matter? Confusion now hath made his masterpiece m m most sacrilegious murder hath broke hope. The Lord's anointing temple and, and, and stole thence the life of the building. What is it you say, the life? Mean you his majesty. Approach the chamber and destroy your sight with, with a new gorgon. Do not bid me speak. See and speak for yourselves. Awake. Awake! Ring the alarm bell! Murder and treason! Banco and Dalbane, Malcolm, awake! Shake off this downy sleep, deep's counterfeit stow, and look on death itself! Up! Up and see the, the great doom's image! Malcolm, thank wow! As from your graves rise up and walk like sprites, and countenance this horror. Ring the bell! But this is such a hideous comfort caused to Barley the sleepers of this house. Speak! Speak! Oh, gentle lady, it is not for you to hear what I speak. The repetition in a woman's ear would, would, would murder as it fell. Banquo, Banquo, our royal master's murdered. Alas, what, in our house? Too cruel anywhere. Dear Duff, I prithee contradict thyself and say it is not so. And I but died an hour before this chance. I had lived a blessed time. For from this instant there's nothing serious in mortality. All's but toys. Renown and grace is dead, the wine is of life is drawn, and mere lees is left this vault to brag of. You ask what is amiss? You are 
Donald Dane and Malcolm and do not know it. The spring, the head, the fountain of your blood is stopped. The very source of it is stopped. Your royal father's murdered. Oh. By whom? Those of his chamber, as it seemed, has, had done. Their hands and faces were all badged with blood. So were their daggers, which unwiped we found upon their pillows. They stared and were distracted. No man's life was to be trusted with them. Oh, yet I do repent me of my fury that I did kill them. What for did you so? Who can be wise, amazed, temperate and furious, loyal and neutral in a moment? <laughs> no man. The expedition of my violent love outrun the pauser, reason. Here lay Duncan, his silver skin laced with his golden blood, and his gashed stabs looked like a breach in nature for ruin's wasteful entrance. There, the murderers, steeped in the colors of their trade, their daggers unmannerly breached with gore. Who could refrain that had a heart to love, and in that heart courage to make love known? Oh, help me, Hunt. Oh, oh. Look to Look the to lady. lady. Oh, I thought that was my line. My bad. Why do we hold our tongues that most may claim this argument for ours? What should be spoken here where our fate hidden in our auger hole may rush and seize us? Let's away. Our tears are not yet brewed. Nor our strong sorrow upon the foot of motion. Look to the lady. And when we have our naked frailties hid that suffer exposure, let us meet and question this most bloody piece of work to know what further fears and, and scruples shake us. In the great hand of God, I stand. And thence, against the undivulged pretense, I fight of treasonous malice. So do I. So, uh, so uh, let's put on manly readiness and meet in the hall together. Well contented. Well contented. Well contented. What will you do? Let's not consort with them. To show an unfelt sorrow is an office which the false man does easy. How to England? To Ireland I. Our separated fortune shall keep us both the safer. Where we are, the... There's... There's daggers in men's smiles. Near in blood, the nearer the bloody. This murderous shaft that shot hath not yet lighted, and our safest way is to avoid the aim. Therefore to horse, and let us not be dainty of leave-taking, but shift away. There's warrant in that theft which steals itself when there's no mercy left. Uh. Three score and ten I can remember well within the volume of which time I have seen hours dreadful and things strange. But this sore night hath trifled former knowings. Ah, good father, thou seest the heavens as troubled with man's act threatens his bloody stage. By the clock it is day, and yet dark night strangles the traveling lamp. Is it night's predominance or the day's shame that darkness does the face of earth entomb when living light should kiss it? Tis unnatural, even like the deed that's done. On Tuesday last, a falcon towering in her pride of place was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. And Duncan's horses, a thing most strange and certain, beauteous and swift, the minions of their race turned wild in nature broke their stalls, flung out, contending against obedience, as they would make war with mankind. Tis said they eat each other. They did so, to the amazement of mine eyes that looked upon it. Uh, here comes the good Macduff. How goes the world, sir, now? Why, said you not? Is it known who did this more than bloody deed? Those that Macbeth has slain. Alas, the day. What good could they pretend? They 
They were so born, Malcolm and Nab uh, Donald Bain, the king's two sons, are stolen away and fled, which puts upon them <sighs> suspicion of the deed. Against nature still, the thriftless ambition that will raven up thine own lives means. Then tis most like the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. He is already named and gone to Scone to be invested. Where is Duncan's body? Carried to Colmacul, the sacred storehouse of his predecessors and guardians of their bones. Will you to Scone? Mm -hmm. No, I will not. I'll to fight. Well, I, I will thither. Well, may you see things well done there. Adieu. Thus our old robes sit easier than our new. Farewell, Father. God's benison go with you, and with those that would make good of bad and friends of foes. Thou hast it now, King. Cawdor, Glamis. All as the weird women promised, and I fear, I fear thou placed most valley for it. Yet, it was said, should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If, if there come truth from them as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine, why, by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my own oracles as well. And set me up in hope. But hush, no more. Here's our chief guest. He had been forgotten. It had been as a gap in our great feast, an old thing unbecoming. Tonight we hold a solemn supper, sir, and I'll request your presence. Let your highness <coughs> command upon me to which my duties are with a most indissoluble tie forever knit. Ride you this afternoon. Aye, my good lord. We should else have desired your good advice, which still hath been both grave and prosperous in this day's council. But we'll take tomorrow. Is it far you ride? As far, my lord, as will fill up the time. Twixt this and supper, you go not my horse, the better I must become a borrower of the night. For a dark or twain. Fail not our feast. My lord, I will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland not confessing their cruel parricide, filling their hearers with strange invention. <laughs> but of that tomorrow, then with all we shall have cause of state craving us jointly. Hi you to horse, adieu, till you return at night. Goes Fleance with you. Aye, my good lord, our time does call upon us. I wish your horses swift and sure of foot. And so I do commend you to their backs. Farewell. Let every man be master of his time till seven at night. To make society the sweeter welcome, we will keep ourself till supper time alone. Well then, God be with you. Sarah, a word with you. Attend those men our pleasure. They are, my they are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. To be thus is nothing. To be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep. And in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares. And to that dauntless temp 
keeper of his mind, he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked, as it said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. Oh, he chid the sisters when they first put the name of king upon me and bade them speak to him. Then, prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding, if it be so. For Banquo's issue have I filled my mind, for them the gracious Duncan have I murdered, put rancors in the vessel of my peace only for them, and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seeds of Banquo kings. Rather than so, Come fate into the list, and champion me to the utterance. Who's there? Now go to the door and stay there till we call. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, so please, your highness. Well then now, have you considered of my speeches? Know that it was he, in the times past, which held you so under fortune, which you thought had been our innocent self. <laughs> this I made good to you in our last conference, passed in probation with you, how you were born in hand, how crossed the instruments, who wrought with them and all things else that might to half a soul and to a notion crazed, say, thus did Banquo. You made it known to us. I did so, and went further which is now the point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? And are you so gospeled to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? We are men, my liege. Aye, in the catalog you go for men. As hounds and greyhounds, mongrels and spaniels, curs, sloughs, water rugs, and demi wolves are all ye clept by the name of dogs. The valued file distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, everyone according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, whereby he does receive particular addition from the bill that writes them all alike and so of men. Now, if you have a station in the file, not in the worst rank of manhood, say it, and I will put that business in your bosom, whose execution takes your enemy off, grapples you to the heart and love of us who wear our health, but sickly in his life, which in his death were most perfect. I am one, my liege whom the vile blows and buffets of the world hath so incensed that I am reckless what I do to spite the world. And I another, so wary with disasters, tugged with fortune, that I would set my life on any chance to mend it or be rid on it. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. True, True. my lord. So is he mine, and in such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrusts against my nearest of life. And though I could with barefaced power sweep him from my sight and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not, for certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, but wail his fall, who I myself struck down. And thence it is that I, to your assistance, do make love, masking the business from the common eye for sundry weighted reasons. We shall, my lord, perform what you command us. Though our lives... Your spirits shine through you. Within this hour at most, I will advise you where to plant yourselves, where to acquaint you to, to the perfect spy of the time, the moment on it, for it must be done tonight, and something from the palace. Always thought that I require a clearness, and with him, to leave no rubs nor blotches in the work, Fleance, his son, that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's. 
must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart. I'll come to you anon. We you are, are resolved, my lord. I'll call upon you straight. Abide within. It is concluded. Banquo, thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Is Banquo gone from court? Aye, madam, but returns again tonight. Say to the king I would attend his leisure for a few words. Madam, I will. <sighs> Lord's had, or spent, and our desire is got without content. It's safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. How now, my lord? Why do you keep alone? Of sorry fancies your companions making, using those thoughts that should indeed have died with them they think of? Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. We have scorched the snake, not killed it. She'll be close and be herself whilst our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. But let the frame of things disjoint both the worlds suffer ere we will eat our meal in fear and sleep ah, in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. Better be with the dead, whom we, to gain our peace, have sent to peace than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Duncan's in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Oh, treason has done his worst, nor steel, nor poison, malice, domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Come on, gentle, my lord. Seek all your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial amongst your guests tonight. So shall I, love. And so I pray, be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo. Present him eminence both with eye and tongue, unsafe the while that we must lave our honors in these flattering streams and make our faces vizards to our hearts, disguising what they are. You must leave this. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowest that Banquo and his fleance lives. But in the nature's copy, not his turn. <laughs> That's comfort yet. <laughs> they are assailable. Oh, you! Then be thou jockened. <laughs> ere the bat hath flown his cloistered flight, ere to black Hecate's summons, the shard born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal. Oh, there shall be done a deed of dreadful note. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. Come, sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. Light thickens, and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, while night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Thou marvelest at my words, but hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. So prithee, go with me. But who did bid thee join with us? <laughs> Guess Macbeth. He's not our mistrust, since he delivers our offices and what we have to do to the direction just. Then stand with us. 
The west yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the later traveler apace to gain the timely inn and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark, I hear horses. Give us a light there, ho. Oh. And tis he. The rest that are within the note of expectation are already at the court. His horses go about. Almost a mile, but he does usually, so all men do, from hence to the palace gate, make it to their walk. A light, a light. Tis he. Stand to it. Will rain tonight. Let it come down! Oh, trust me. Fly, Kaflance, fly! 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 Thou mayest revenge! Oh, slave. <laughs> Who did strike out the way? Was not the way. <laughs> There's but one down. The sun has fled. I have lost, I lost Beth half our affair. Well, let's away and say how much is done. 